This session is on practice management. A couple of housekeeping things. Right after the next two speakers, there is a reception uh, by our wonderful host who put on this meeting. And by the way, I don't know if you're as excited as I am, but I think this first day has been incredible. And I'd just like to give a round of applause to the organizers of the meeting. One of them is standing in the back. Thank you. I imagine we'll see continuing success and growth. The last speaker, I never heard of Avamar. Uh, and the potential, people coming here together, learning new things, the potential to get our arms around cancer in this century, highly likely to happen. And I find it, what a way to cross-fertilize each other's knowledge and information. The next couple of sessions, practice management, are very practical. A housekeeping event, there will be a non-CME activity tomorrow night after the last talk on uh, building age management practice. Most people who come into this field come with a story. The passion that people have when they go into age management is driven by a personal experience, by a relative experience, perhaps a patient. Mickey Barber, her real name is Michael, but she doesn't look like Michael. She looks like Mickey. Eight years ago, full-time anesthesiologist became ill Blood pressure 230 over 140. Extreme fatigue, cholesterol 352, told it was all due to genetics and age, and we've heard that story before. She found age management medicine as a way to positively impact her health and decided with her whole heart and soul that she wanted to bring the opportunity of age management medicine not only because we want to lead healthier lives, but to our patients. Uh, Mickey's built a center in Charleston, South Carolina. It's now into its sixth month and a roaring success, so no one can better tell the story of how to do this than somebody who's really doing it. Dr. Barber? Thank you, Alan. Thank you all very much. I need to get oriented up here a second. This is it? Yes. Welcome. Gosh, I'm actually shocked to see this many people interested in the business of age management medicine. And uh, they never say never, ever. Um, I was on faculty at Tulane University for seven years, and I swore when I got into this field of age management medicine that I would never lecture to a group of physicians. And here I am. Um, the part that makes it okay is that I'm not talking about medicine this time. I'm talking about business which I think is really important for you to hear that from a doctor. Alan told part of my story. Um, I was quite ill, and I had a very significant family history. My father had his first heart attack at 41. My brother had his for first heart attack at 43. And I had my children when I was 39 and 40. So I did not think I could afford to have a heart attack. So I got very interested in prevention for myself personally, and I've taken that particular interest and now expanded that into my taking care of my patients and building a business from that. And I encourage all of you to sit there today and think about it for your own health and then how you can apply it to the health of your patients as well. Let's see if we can get this going. Why age management? Why now? That's the question. Four years ago, I was sitting at a medical meeting just like you are. And I asked myself this question, what is a perfectly competent anesthesiologist doing in a place like this? Some of you may be asking yourself that exact same question. Hopefully I can help to answer that question for you a little bit. Why age management, why now? Well, one of the reasons is that how we view aging is changing. We used to think about it like this. One day you're a real hot dog, then suddenly you become a tired old weenie. But well, we don't really think about it that way anymore. We know that we can stay healthy and stay energized, avoid degenerative diseases through the aging process, through prevention and the things we have to offer. What about patients? Why would patients be interested in what we have in age management medicine? Well, there are a lot of us. One person turns 50 every seven seconds. And of that group of patients, prospective patients, no matter what survey you read, health is in the top three major concerns of that group of individuals. People are frustrated. The average time a physician spends with their patients now is three minutes or less. 
And conventional medicine is about disease, as you've heard over and over today. And patients are very frustrated with that situation as well. I think this is really the interesting way to look at this. Right now, one in every six Americans is 60 or older. Now, that's a lot. And that population is living longer. So by the time we get to the year 2030, the number of people over 85 will increase from 4.2 million to 8.9 million patients. So when I hear, I said patients, didn't I? See, that's an optimist. Um, when I hear people say, well, I don't have enough patients in my area, there aren't enough people who will be interested in this, you have, by the year 2030, 8.9 potential patients right now. If you look at this differently, and Alan had this slide up earlier, but look out here at our opportunity. Let's see if I can get this to work. Right here. People are going to be living longer, and there are no doctors other than those in this room today, in my opinion, that can really capitalize on this opportunity to extend the quality of life as we age. They're just not out there. I hear my patients tell me all the time, where have you been? We've been looking for you. The medical community is getting on the bandwagon finally as well. The American Journal of Medicine in 2004 said the time has come to abandon disease as the focus of medical care. Medical care that is centered on the diagnosis and treatment of individual disease is at best out of date and at worst harmful. Big statement, but a big part of what we do in age management medicine. What about doctors? Why be interested in this? Why is this for you? Well. We know malpractice is out of control. In fact, since 2000, it has increased 120% in some cities. Low job satisfaction. You talk to physicians, anesthesiologists, surgeons, internists, family practitioners, OBGYNs, very low job satisfaction. Part of the reason, rising malpractice premiums and poor insurance reimbursement. So what you're doing is working longer, harder, for less. And equally frustrating for the doctor, being able to spend less than three minutes with a patient. Most physicians feel like they cannot deliver quality care. They cannot really focus on the health of their patients, given the time constraints that they are under. In age management medicine, we focus on exercise, nutrition, and hormones. Alan talked about a symphony. I talk about it like a jigsaw puzzle, where you have all these pieces, and if you don't have all the pieces, there is no puzzle. Certainly, I think the part that we have that other physicians don't talk about is the hormonal component. Sometimes people say, well, is this an alternative medical practice? Absolutely not. What is more basic and conventional than nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, and hormones? It's the basis. It's traditional medicine at its best. We can actually make a difference. Age management delivers the philosophy and methodology for youthful aging. And what we do is we really are bridging that gap between conventional medicine and 21st century proactive approach. What we're going to do is lead to a better quality of life and an extended health span. Who are the doctors that should be interested in this? That's the big question. I mean, there are a lot of you here today, and I'm really astounded by how many are in the room for this particular lecture. Um, and are you the right person for this? Because a lot of you won't be. You need to be people-oriented. You're going to spend a lot of time with your patients. You need to be prepared for that. It's kind of interesting. As an anesthesiologist, you know, I spent about two minutes, <laughs> a lot more now. You need to be outgoing. You have to be able to talk to people and get your message across. I think it's very, very important that you walk the walk. What is more frustrating than going to see a cardiologist who's 50 pounds overweight and smoking a cigarette? It's the same in this field. You need to really believe in the program. You need to follow the program and walk the walk. I recommend that you have some source of income for the first two years that you're building this practice. It is not easy. It does require financial investment and a time investment. So look at your financial assets, you know, see how can you live 
for a couple of years without a substantial income coming from this practice. This is the hard one. Be comfortable with the idea of selling your practice. Selling, that's the word. It's not a dirty word, it's part of how you build the practice. Now, plastic surgeons have been selling their practice for a long time. That's what they do every day. They have people in their office that help, but it's really the plastic surgeon who, just like we saw earlier today, shows what he or she can do for the patient. That's what you have to do to build this practice. And it's very important to be certified and know age management medicine. You have to be comfortable with the medicine itself. So who are the patients that we see? Well, we see more male patients than female. I found that really surprising. That was not what I expected, even though the people that I was associated with told me that's how the practice went for them. I think that, that there are a couple reasons for that. One is most females have some connection with a physician, their OBGYN most likely, and most men don't. Men do not go to the doctor until they're really sick or they're in the emergency room with the defibrillator paddles on their chest. Most women have that association earlier. So most of our patients are men. The age of our patients are between 40 and 69, 90% of our patients. We have some younger, some older. Most of them are business owners, executives, or professionals, and the families of those people. So it is a very distinct group of patients that we are treating. We're going to talk some about how you actually set the practice up, and I'm going to cover these different areas, the space involved, what we recommend, what diagnostics do we think you need, what are the time requirements to get this kind of a practice up and running, what about reimbursements, is that something you even want to think about, patient recruitment, how do you get those patients into your practice, how do you have them coming to you, and a financial model that, that works. I was talking to uh, someone earlier, another physician, about how when I started, and it's really pretty funny when we think about it now, <laughs> it wasn't so funny then, but I didn't have an office. I was an anesthesiologist, so I had no office, no patients. So people said, how'd you get patients? Well, I would go up to, say, a guy at the gym who I'd watched not been able to get rid of this pot belly for a year and say, you know, I've been watching you and I think I could help you. And, and this doctor said, man, that really took some you-know-whats. And I said, well, true, but I had no patients, so I had to do something. I had no office. So what I did was actually rent what we called a virtual office, which involved not just an office, but the whole office staff, the fax machines, the computers, the phones, et cetera, et cetera. So look at your own practice, what you're doing now, and should you use the existing space? Maybe not. Certainly, if you have space where you have patients that are on Medicare, Medicaid, insurance, very tough to bring in these types of patients for an age management medical practice into that situation. I spoke earlier with someone and recommended that he rent that sort of virtual office space in a Class A facility, beautiful, contemporary, and so maybe one day a week where you could see patients in there so you can really sort out the difference in those two practices. Keep in mind that this is a private pay practice. So if you're going to share space with another physician, that needs to be sharing with a physician who has a private pay practice, for example, a plastic surgeon. There are two websites up here that can help you to find those available um, office spaces that, again, are that executive virtual office arrangement, hq.com and offices to share.com. I don't think we had those when I first started, but that's a really good thing you to be able to tap into. I started with a virtual office, then I moved to a small office, really small office, um, in a very nice section of Charleston, and outgrew that after two years. And then, as fate would have it, uh, Alan and John called me from Cenogenics and said, we would like a physician partner, and you're our first one. Would you be interested in an age management medical center? And, I said yes, <laughs> right away, and um, it's been a very interesting uh, year since that conversation, and we've learned a lot, and I'm going to try to share with you some of the things that we've learned along the way. Um, we believe now that we need to have a space of about 3,000 square feet. The space I'm in now is about 2,600 square feet, and it's a little bit tight. 
The ultimate plan is to have three to four physicians. I do clinical work. I am scaling down on that somewhat. And I also have a, have a partner who uh, has 25 years of, of experience as a cardiologist who is now full-time age management in my practice as well. What things do we look at in the actual floor plan of our center? We want a physician's office, of course, and hopefully two or three. We want what we call a VIP suite, which is a very nice room done very comfortably where the patient will spend the majority of their time while they're in our office for an evaluation. You want an exam room, which is exactly that, where you'll obviously do their physical exam. And then we use a lunar densitometer to measure their body fat and their bone density. Very important part of our evaluation. This is my office. Uh, just to tell you some things that we think are good and maybe not so good, it's in a very, very beautiful office building. It's upstairs from Saks Fifth Avenue in the downtown area of Charleston. And location is very important. The first month I was in that office space, I picked up three patients whose offices were down the hall who just walked in to tour the facility. So it's amazing what a change in location can do for you. We have a beautiful lobby. When you walk into the lobby, you are just greeted with a beautiful space. Artwork on the walls. It's very contemporary, very simple. We serve our patients lunch, so we have a kitchen. Um, we recommend, if you can, have another way of bringing in food, but we found we could not afford, really, the food in downtown Charleston to feed our patients, so we prepare food there in the office. This is where our business staff uh, does their work. This is what we call a rejuvenation room, which is really patients can go in there to relax. We do some of our consultations in there, and we also have our nutritional video that is part of our evaluation that they watch in that room as well. This is our exam room. This is the lunar densitometer room, the three doctor's offices, the VIP rooms, and then the exit. This is not necessarily, necessarily the only plan, but this is the plan that we have, and it's working well for us now. What about the diagnostics? Really, I think the core of what we do has to do with the lab panel. Um, we were talking earlier, one of the lectures about inflammation. You want some inflammatory markers, C-reactive protein, homocysteine. Obviously, you want the free uh, hormone levels, cholesterol. But you need to find a lab. We use Quest Diagnostics that can provide you with a comprehensive lab panel. We do cognitive testing in the office where you take a laptop test and it tests your memory recall and response. People are very worried about their memory. This is a way to document it and track it over long term. We have a lunar densitometer, as I mentioned earlier. We do strength testing with uh, dumbbells and flexibility testing. And then we do digital photography to document progress in the patient. Who staffing. Anyone who has a doctor's office knows what a headache. I hear sighs coming from everywhere. Really important, especially in this type of a practice, you want someone who presents themselves very well, who is very professional, who can do a lot of different jobs, who really serves as an executive assistant to you and also to the patients. You know, the patients are spending a great deal of money for a very valuable experience, and you want them to be treated like they are a top-paying patient. You can find some of those on monster.com. We use that as a way to find... Um, our help. You want to start, you want to locate that person. If you leave here today and you're interested in this, you need to start looking today because they're not easy to find. And you want to start them out part-time from the beginning, helping you to build your practice. And they will be connected to you in your practice throughout the progress. They will quickly move to full-time as you build your practice and then you will add people in as you need them. Another really important thing is to get someone to help you with the nutritional and exercise component. At first, I did all that myself, and it, it was a two-hour experience plus two more hours, four hours with the patient. You can't build a practice and do that at the same time. So we are using um, two certified personal trainers who are well-trained in nutrition, and they do the nutritional and uh, exercise component, which lasts between an hour and a half and two hours. A phlebotomist. We offer at-home blood draws. We encourage that. That way we get a resting level of their hormones. It's convenient for them. Very hard. You need to find someone in your area that you can pay to go to the patient's homes and draw the blood. 
If you rely, in my opinion, if you rely on some of these other companies to do that, you'll, it'll be fraught with problems. You have to generate your patients. They're not going to know about you just by chance. You have to market yourself and market the practice. You need to do a market analysis, marketing material, advertising, networking events, websites, and try to think about keeping the cost of what you spend per lead to approximately $100. When you do a market analysis of your area, think about these things. How many people in your area, and that could be the whole state, it could be six county area, it doesn't have to be just in your city. How many people have a household income of greater than $200,000? How many people of that group are between 35 and 70 years of age? Is there a concentration of executives, owners, of businesses, professionals? And do their family and friends live there? Is there an affluent retirement community? In Charleston, we, it is an affluent retirement community, although we draw from patients from North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, D.C., et cetera. Marketing materials. Don't go overboard. I went overboard. I recommend you don't do it. Uh, find business cards. You know, if you're going to affiliate with Cenogenics, you're going to have business cards that you can use. You want a website where people can get on and they register so that you know they've been on your website. You want simple brochures that explain what you do and highlight the physicians in the practice. You want some article reprints. So people want to be able to read or at least hold on to them and, and feel like they've read it. So you want some articles available. And it's nice to have a DVD or a CD set that, again, explains what we do in the program and explains the history of what we do. Advertising and public relations. Now, advertising has always been a dirty word in the medical community. It wasn't until plastic surgeons got a little bit bold and then hospitals started. And, and slowly over time, it's become less of a dirty word. We, when we first started in my practice, uh, we did no advertising. It was all word of mouth. And the practice grew, but it was not very quickly. And then after a year in the practice, we decided to try some advertising without a PR firm. And so we ran some ads in some local, uh, particularly women's magazines. And it was met with mixed success. We then decided to hire a local advertising PR firm. And I recommend you all do that. Do not go for a large national company. They are really not going to care about you and your practice. What you want to find is some people in the area, sort of a mom and pops group, who are really interested in helping you to build this practice. They'll be interested because it will help them a lot and because they will watch something go from the infancy. And it's nice if you find people that are connected with the media in some way. Our PR firm, both of the women who are in that firm, had worked for two different news stations. They were news commentators. So they're connected with a lot of people in the area. But most importantly, they're very passionate and energetic about what we do. And in my opinion, that's more important than all the credentials on the wall or an, a resume that's six pages thick. Now, what way do you advertise? Well, we've tried pretty much all of them. Uh, print is a good thing. The best advertising you can get other than your patients, however, is to have some kind of a feature article written about the practice. That is, of course, free and gets out there. When people can read about it, then it really it resonates with them. And in fact, I've had patients come in carrying an article that was in the paper about me or the practice three years ago, that they cut it out and stuck it up on their refrigerator because something about that hit, hit a place in their heart. So get out there in print. You want to be out there. You want to be recognized. We do some radio advertising. The interesting thing, if you know anything about advertising, though, it takes it five to six exposures before someone actually commits. So it's hard to track specifically which of these things is the major hit. Because sometimes patients come in and they'll say, well, I saw your ad in so-and-so, and I heard you on the radio, and then a friend of mine knows a patient of yours, and so now they're up to five exposures. So don't get discouraged if you don't immediately get back the kind of response that you think you should for a particular form of advertising. The radio slots may be something in your area that will work, and they're relatively inexpensive. 
events. You do have to get out and attend events where there would be people that would meet your criteria as patients so that you're visible, they see you, they will start to trust you. Networking, another kind of dirty word in the medical community, but it's important too. Where do you do that networking? Well, obviously family, friends, acquaintances, other physicians. If you know plastic surgeons in your area, you know, go to their office. Sit down, meet with them. Meet them for dinner one night. Call them on the phone. Hey, this is what I'm doing. I just thought you ought to know. And I think that your patients will do better if they look at this program and maybe get on the program even while they're having plastic surgery, after they've had a procedure or before. Or more importantly, why don't you look at it? Because once the patient, the physician becomes your patient, you're more likely to get patients from that physician. Business organizations, I belong to the um, Chamber of Commerce Lead Investors Group, which is a group of professionals, uh, business owners. We meet maybe three or four times a year, but they're very small groups and it allows people to get to know you personally. Again, social organizations, health clubs. I spent a lot of time the first two years giving talks, informational talks, to high-end health clubs. Sometimes it paid off, sometimes it didn't. What I got from one of those, though, were the two personal trainers that are now working in my office and four patients. So it does take going out there, and, and you want people to understand what you do because age management medicine, if you don't explain it, they won't know what it is. Country clubs, corporations, again, really targeting the group of potential patients that this practice is about. One-on-one, -on -one, obviously sitting down meeting with, with a patient, a potential, a potential patient or with physicians or business owners, corporate executives, one-on-one -on -one, will be part of what you should do to promote yourself. Small groups work well too. We did lunches at one point in time where we would invite people in to a small restaurant. These were patients and patients' guests when I was first starting. We would uh, do an informational um, um, presentation about hormones or nutrition, and people really enjoy that, and that helped us to generate interest and to generate patience when we first started. You want that to be in the form of a lecture and allow them time to ask questions because that communication, again, is going to really stoke up the interest. High-end social venues, charity events, and again, try to keep any time that you prevent, present really with a substantial educational content. Give yourself some time with the marketing. When you're really up and you're starting to build a full-time practice, you're going to be spending about $10,000 a month on advertising. So you need to plan on at least four months of that expenditure because you cannot judge the success of your advertising campaign in a month. You want to keep your acquisition costs per patient at less than $1,000. So you need to keep track of that. If you've done this lecture and you've done this advertising, someone in your office needs to be keeping track of where did that patient come from and was our money well spent. If you have a full center, you, you need to plan on spending about $20,000 a month in advertising to get out there and get the word out, not just in your own community, but throughout the state or maybe a two or three state region. Let's talk a little bit about how the financial model is set up in our practice. I really encourage you not to reinvent the wheel. That's very hard for physicians because we're smart and we're creative and we think we know better than everyone else. But I really encourage you to look at what is working out there in the medical community and follow our lead because you can spend a whole lot of time trying to reinvent the wheel. Again, the model that we use focuses on nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, and hormones for optimal health. That is working. That is what age management is about. So however you set your practice up, I would recommend you follow these criteria. This is what we do. We do what we call an executive health evaluation. Again, as I said earlier, the core of that is the comprehensive lab panel. And then the patients have a six-hour experience. They will spend about two hours with a physician in consultation. They will spend about an hour and a half with our exercise and nutritional consultant. 
The cognitive test that I mentioned earlier lasts a half an hour, 20 minutes to a half an hour. The nutritional DVD or video lasts a half an hour. Lunar densitometers, 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes as well. Then we, we do serve them lunch, and we have our strength testing, which is another half an hour. And then we get down to the end of the day. This is what we call the program review and close. Now, when I first started this practice, I said, I can't talk to people about money. I'm an anesthesiologist. People didn't even think we got paid. You know, when they would get the bill, they would say, what, we have to pay them? Now, I, I was in a position of actually asking patients for money. Now, we believe it works better if the physician does the asking because we understand the program. We understand why growth hormone costs what it does. We understand why this many milligrams of this cost this much. And by that time, by the end of that six-hour experience, the patient understands the value of you as a physician. So we recommend that you as a physician do that yourself. It gets easier. In fact, it's very easy now. But it takes a little practice, and it takes confidence in yourself. My uh, cardiology partner was scared to death of it, obviously, because he was used to fighting with patients, trying to collect on Medicare and insurance, et cetera, et cetera. But he actually has surprised himself in the last two months, has been 100% successful in getting his patients to commit to the program over the long term. So at the end of that day, the patients will have committed to working with you, to partnering with you as a physician. And they will make that commitment every six months in the form of a renewable professional fee that really permits you to medically manage their program, to review labs with them, to give your suggestions as far as diet and nutritional changes, to really work with them specifically. Let's talk a little bit about the insurance. We do not take insurance. The insurance companies do not pay us. We do not take Medicare. Medicare does not pay us. You need to be very comfortable saying that. What we do is we give this little blurb to our patients to give them some ideas about how they could possibly not feel that pain so much. We tell them that the insurance companies do not pay us. And to consider some other programs that give the patient tax advantages to offset health care costs, HSAs, MSAs, FSAs. So we give them some ideas. And many of the patients already have those programs. And if they don't, they can have them set up in many instances. Certain medical expenses, as we all know, may also be eligible as a tax deduction on your 1040. So give them that information. And again, be adamant. We do not take insurance. We don't file your insurance. Once you finish your evaluation day, you can take that information and do with it what you want, but these are some, some ways that you can possibly benefit from a tax perspective from your investment in your health. Patient pricing. Currently, the executive health evaluation, which includes all of the labs and all of the diagnostics that we talked about, is $2,495. That renewable semi-annual professional partnership fee is $1,195, and that goes into effect at the end of this day if the patient commits to working with us. We do offer special physician pricing. We think that's very important. Almost a third of our patients are physicians, and so we really appreciate that they trust us, and we appreciate that they need to be as healthy as the rest of the world. And so we offer a physician pricing. We also offer couples and corporate discounts. Uh, many times couples will come in and we do the day together with the couple, and that works really well because you're talking about changes in nutrition and lifestyle, and you want to have both members of the couple there together. Also corporate discounts. If you have someone who's a corporate executive, next thing you know, he's going to want to send in his uh, vice president and another vice president. So you, you want to recognize that and, and show your appreciation. And again, like a broken record, keep remembering that it can be tax deductible and that we do not take insurance. Now, I do encourage you not to go crazy discounting when you first get started. Um, many people will be um, compelled to do that. Uh, then you get a patient who actually can't afford the program, and so they won't be with you for long. If you look at what we take out of that 2495, the lab panel, nutritionist, cognitive testing, et cetera, then that brings us to a gross profit of 
$1,550 for each evaluation. If you look at the semi-annual professional fee, you see there's a whole lot less taken out. There's the credit card fee, and that renews every six months. So again, we're at $2,300 for that professional fee per patient. So if you look at this a little differently, these EHEs are evaluation days, 100 patients. That's a gross profit of $155,000. 200, 310, and you can see the numbers. The semi-annual professional fee, again, this shows a committed patient and a committed physician. When you get up to 200 patients, which is where we are very close to now, then you, you see the gross profit is, is much greater. The maximum number of patients that we recommend for a center for each physician is 500 patients to be able to manage. You have to take those patient leads and turn them into patients. That requires about 20 hours a week from a physician, minimum. So be prepared to spend a great deal of your time marketing the practice. And you do that by being on the phone. If you don't like the phone, you won't like this. <laughs> Emails, again, one-to-one -one meetings. And then you need to be going back constantly and looking at, of all the people I meet with, of all the leads I talk to, how many of those do I actually turn into patients? How many of those do I actually close? Again, keeping that acquisition cost at less than $1,000 per patient. Again, an age management medical center, physician capacity, 500 patients. It's definitely a five-year investment to get there. The amount of time you'll spend, 2,500 hours. Advertising expenses, those are some fixed expenses of 350000 the shared space, obviously there's no build-out involved. If it's a new space, and this is wrong here, this should be 3,000 square feet. The build-out is about $450,000. And new space and furniture, 150000 Malpractice, just to say a quick word about this, age management physicians are rated at the lowest risk category, similar to family practice or internal medicine. This contact information is in the syllabus. You may want to call them and talk to them and get some more information about uh, the malpractice coverage. The next lecture is about the legal ramifications of our practice. Um, take a look at this. You know, become familiar with this. To get started, find the space, find the staff, get your diagnostics, make your connections along those lines, get your local marketing, public relations group, interview them, be comfortable with them. Marketing materials we talked about earlier. Remember, it's no insurance. You want to get those semi-annual professional fees and get started. This is the most important part. This is why we do this. These are testimonials. Dr. Barber did a very good job explaining my test results in a way that was easy to understand. A very well-spent day. New insight on how to improve my overall health. Staff was incredibly friendly. Never had a health evaluation that was as detailed and as formative. Finally, a truly holistic approach. I am so excited to get started. For you to get started, you need to focus on, at some point, after a year or so, 15 new patients a month. And last. Oh, go back. Do I need to go back? <laughs> 